Commissioner, thanks. Um, I appreciate you taking time. I know you're busy. Um, the question that I'm sure you get a lot, um, that a lot of people want to know, is just how close are we to having a COVID-19 vaccine approved and available? So, um, Brian, um, I've said multiple times before, I was a cancer doctor, as you know, at MD Anderson before I came to this job, and I don't have a crystal ball. I used to tell my patients that all the time, but I can sort of give you the facts as I know them, and I don't have a crystal ball here, and it would be very inappropriate for me to prejudge. The bottom line is companies that are manufacturing, we call them sponsors, that are, manu that are manufacturing developing vaccines, when their trials are mature, when the data are ready, they will submit an application to us. We will review that application and we will judge on the merits of that application, the science and data to determine whether a vaccine is safe and effective. Now, everybody in America wants a vaccine that's safe and effective and as quickly as possible. So we have urgency about that, but we're not gonna cut any corners with respect to our review of it. Um, yesterday, President Trump came out and said that we could have a vaccine by October. Is that realistic? So again, I, I, I think this really depends on when the data mature from a clinical trial. We have three clinical trials that are in the later stages at this point. When those data are ready, those applications will come to us and that's when we'll make the determination. So again, no crystal ball, Brian, with respect to when that would occur. Do you feel pressure from the Trump administration to have a vaccine approved by, at least by the end of the year? We all, I think, uh, feel the pressure of the moment with respect to COVID-19. As I mentioned, everybody in America wants a safe and effective vaccine, but everybody in America wants it to actually be safe and effective, and we won't cut corners with respect to that. So. Again, we'll look at the data when it's available. We have incredible scientists who will review the data um, and we will make the decision that's right for the American people, that I'm confident of, and we will do it based upon the data and the science. You recently mentioned about the possibility of ending clinical trials early. Um, under what circumstances would you approve a vaccine that hasn't completed, I guess, its third clinical trial? Yeah, so these are what we call phase three trials. And just to correct the record, um, I did not say that we would end trials early. FDA does not end trials. Um, what we do is we receive data from manufacturers, from sponsors of the vaccines, and then we look at those data. Now, what happens is that these are what's called event-driven trials, meaning that you're looking at these trials for certain endpoints. In this case, did you prevent COVID-19 from occurring? That would be a really important endpoint from a clinical trial. And if the data from the trial show that that endpoint has been achieved, then that trial, at that point, the data can be released from the trial and put as part of an application. But that responsibility of looking at those data are completely with those who are running the trial. We'll receive the data after that, and then we'll make our determination, which is independent of their determination, about whether those data support that the vaccine is safe and effective. So how quickly from the moment you receive that, that data, how quickly could a vaccine be approved from that point? So we're, we're planning in-house. Uh, Brian, it's a really excellent question because we have been planning for the last month and a half how we would approach when data are available to us, understanding that we're not going to cut corners, that we have to follow all of the procedures of looking at the data, but at the same time, understanding the urgency of the situation. So um, we would want to look at those data and it would depend upon those data how long it would take us. But as you know, we've committed to having and scheduling when we receive data, vaccine advisory committees, which are external groups of experts who will advise us on the applications. So that process does take some time. We will use that process to make the determination. So the other day we asked our viewers if a vaccine or when a vaccine became available and was approved, if they would get one. And it was real unscientific. We basically posted it on social media, but more than half of those who responded said no, they would not feel comfortable with getting a, a vaccine, even if one was approved. Are you concerned that there are so many people out there that say that they won't get a vaccine? 
Uh, yes, I'm, I'm definitely concerned, Brian. I mean, as you know, there are folks who don't want to take vaccines that have been on the market for years. Um, and now, of course, we have a, a, a novel uh, coronavirus. We have a pandemic that's unlike anything we've seen um, in a very long period of time. Um, and we have an urgency around that public health crisis. Um, it's why FDA um, has been transparent about what information would we need to see what around efficacy, what around safety, in order for us to feel comfortable with the process of calling the balls and strikes on safety and efficacy. And the bottom line here is that our scientists will look at those data, as I've mentioned to you a couple times, and we will use our rigorous and high standards to make that determination. Now, what I'd love for the American people and what I hope is that hearing us talk about this, talking about the external group that's also going to review this, the Vaccine Advisory Committee, our being transparent about the data that we're looking at and about our decision making, that that will help go a long way toward calming fears about a vaccine. Would you support states mandating a vaccine? We know legally they could. So um, this is really a question best addressed by the, the CDC because they will be responsible, as they are with flu and other vaccines, for the distribution, the allocation, et cetera. What I tell you is that um, I can assure the states that when they make determinations about this vaccine, that FDA will be using the highest standards to make the assessment of safety and efficacy. And I hope that makes them comfortable in whatever decision making they have. Do you feel like we will need a, a mandate if so many people are uncomfortable about getting a, a vaccine? And, and I know that creates all sorts of sometimes, you know, the mandate may encourage some people not to get it. Yeah, I am. Um, again, I, I don't want to prejudge, you know, a mandate or not. This is a local decision. Um, as a federal government employee, we would support local decision making. But I hope that we can get people to the point in America where they understand what we're doing with respect to the um, oversight of this regulatory process, of the decision making that we're, that we're doing, um, so that uh, folks can be more comfortable with the ultimate outcome, whatever that is. Commissioner, if you don't mind me kind of shifting gears a little bit here, um, I know a few weeks ago you were, you were criticized for, I guess, maybe overselling the, um, the effectiveness of plasma as a treatment for COVID-19. I know you, the very next day you came back and, and kind of clarified and, and corrected what you said, but there are still critics out there that are concerned that the FDA is putting politics ahead of science. And I know you have mentioned we will not cut corners with a vaccine, but what do you say to those that say, well, we, we heard what you had said about the plasma and now they're applying that criticism to the vaccine. Well, as I mentioned in my public statements, the criticism was justified. Um, and um, I have corrected the record. I could have done a better job of describing those data. Um, and um, it's time to move forward. It's time for us to look at the vaccine. We wanna be very transparent about it. Uh, we wanna be clear about the data we wanna look at. And that's my pledge to the American people. We will be transparent about what we're doing. We'll be transparent about the information we have and about the process as well. Because we do want people to have faith in the FDA and to be comfortable with it. We have terrific, terrific scientists, doctors, nurses who help us make these decisions every day. Um, and they really do deserve the support of the American people because they're doing incredible work and have done incredible work on behalf of Americans during this COVID-19 pandemic. You recently approved the use of remdesivir as a treatment for patients with moderate COVID-19. How effective is this drug as a treatment? So um, we initially received data in May, as you know, May 1st was our initial authorization of remdesivir based upon a very well-performed randomized clinical trial. Um, and our assessment at the time is that um, it was for a certain group of hospitalized patients. Now, like everything we've done during this um, pandemic, and, and Brian, I'm glad you asked it because we throw around this term emergency use authorization. What that means is that the legal standard there is um, something may be effective and um, the risks are lower than the benefits in the situation. We've applied that across the board, but we always look at updated data. And in, case of, in the case of remdesivir, we had additional data from additional trials 
that further informed this expansion of the emergency use authorization. And what our data show is that this reduces hospital stay associated with COVID-19, which is a really good thing um, for patients with COVID-19. It adds another weapon to the arsenal against COVID-19. And so very comfortable that this is um, a drug that meets the criteria for emergency use authorization and certainly stand by the decision making of the agency around it. You know, at one time we had heard that hydroxychloroquine was the quote unquote miracle treatment drug for COVID-19. What makes remdesivir different than that? So as you know, um, with hydroxychloroquine, our initial emergency use authorization was given based upon the published literature at the time and was done so that we could get more drug into the system because we had received government, had received donated drug. And in order to get that drug into the system, and we knew there was great demand, we issued the emergency use authorization. Emergency use authorization um, is based upon, in this case, the, the trial that um, showed that it was a potential benefit in hospitalized patients. As we gathered more data, we saw that the randomized clinical trials showed that it hadn't benefited or it wasn't benefiting hospitalized patients. And as you know, on June, in the middle of June, we revoked that EUA based upon an application that was sent to us by um, one, one of the uh, groups within Health and Human Services. Bottom line is, like remdesivir, we will update our authorizations based upon new data. In the case of hydroxychloroquine, the data did not support going forward with it. We revoked it. With the case of remdesivir, the data did support it, and we expanded it. And we will continue to follow that paradigm as we move forward. We brought up plasma. We're going to do the same thing with plasma. We're collecting additional data. We will be transparent about those data. Our scientists will, uh, will, will have those data available. And then we will let the American people know what we're doing with respect to that EUA as we move forward. So we'll continue this same approach throughout the pandemic. Is there a shortage of remdesivir? We're seeing a lot of reports across the country and even some hospitals saying that they don't have enough. So the, the information that we're receiving from our partners at the states um, is that they have adequate supplies. Um, this uh, the remdesivir is allocated through Health and Human Services uh, to the states, and then the states are responsible for that allocation. Um, so we continue to be in an open dialogue with the governors and health commissioners from the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Um, the, the task force has been working with uh, Health and Human Services on this. Um, but the good news is we're expecting um, greater uh, production of remdesivir throughout the uh, uh, several months of, the, of this year. So um, if there's any pressure right now on supply, um, that should be helped with the additional uh, drug that's being produced by uh, the manufacturer. And that would also account for the, I guess, the wider approval of the use as well. That's right. That's right. And that was one of the things, obviously, we wanted to, to incorporate as well was the fact that we knew additional drug was coming. We had this additional data um, and we made a decision based upon the science and data, but also knew that more drug was coming, which, of course, is a, is a beneficial thing as well. And I guess just finally, and again, thank you, Commissioner, for taking time to, to talk with us today. I um, know you're extremely busy. Um, notice that you were on Twitter um, this morning. You have written a, an op-ed in the Washington Post. Um, you know, you're, you're here speaking with us. Why all of a sudden, um, and I guess maybe not all of a sudden, but why is there this public outreach from you? What message are you really trying to get across to the American people? Well, um, I and FDA have been messaging about our work uh, throughout the pandemic, but given the significant public interest in vaccines, um, we really want to lay the groundwork to be transparent about all we're doing regarding the vaccine process. We realize that this is top of mind for everyone. We realize that Americans feel an urgency around this, um, and we wanna make sure that the American public knows what we're doing at FDA to make the absolute best decision for them. And the bottom line is that I can promise you that we will not cut corners and that we will use science and data to make our decision. Commissioner, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Brian. My best to the people of Texas. Texas 101, making real Texas sweet iced tea.